Please join me as we lift up our joys and our struggles before our covenant God. Holy Father, like the psalm writers of long ago, we turn to look into your eyes. Your eyes of compassion see us with tenderness. You see our anxiety and tension, our fears and worries, but also our joys and our courage in the face of so much uncertainty. A tiny virus has quickly caused so much death in our world and so much economic and political chaos. Loving Lord Jesus, we are here in your presence together as your people. We can't see each other, but we can feel one another's affirming each other's prayers. We join in trying to coordinate our voices to sing your praise, and together we are listening intently for a word of hope, a new promise of your faithfulness. We are here this morning to bear witness to the power of the Holy Spirit who connects your word to our hearts and connects our lives in supportive prayer for each other and guides the witness of our words and lives to neighbors near and far. Holy Spirit, you are the one who gives life and vitality to our spirits. You turn our jumbled mixture of feelings and anxieties into these worship moments of calming and rejoicing, even celebrating. For you are at work in this pandemic. You are working in our individual hearts. You are working in our country. You are working on the world stage as well. More than ever, we are forced to abandon our individualism and see ourselves as part of a worldwide human community. All faiths, even faith deniers, every person struggling to cope and needing each other's support and encouragement. You, O oh God, have stood by us throughout the centuries. You have called us to spread the good news of God's grace, God's powerful love, God's dependable faithfulness. We yield our lives over to your purposes in this pandemic. We pray for those struggling with unemployment and fear of unemployment. We pray for family members who have had accidents. We pray for those who are facing life-threatening illnesses. We pray for those who are lonely in this extended season of confinement. We pray for those anticipating the birth of babies. We also hold up the struggling world, especially those in Africa as they brace themselves for what lies ahead. And we pray for those who themselves are fighting the virus and those in panic that they might get the virus. We lift up the helpers, the doctors and nurses and nursing home staff who are under great stress. Keep them healthy and give them courage, Lord Jesus. We pray for our governors and national leaders that they might set aside grudges and political differences and find a new spirit of joy in working together. Holy Spirit, breathe a new harmony into our fractured, politically divided country. Look on us with your mercy. Turn the tide of evil, turn the wave of death, turn the loving actions into faith-filled commitment to your kingdom rule. Turn your eyes of mercy to our aching and desperate pleas for help. Open supply lines, soften hard hearts, soothe the frenzied and desperate souls. Unleash new wisdom, new discoveries, new partnerships. O oh God, may your people, Christians and non-Christians, glimpse the risen Christ alive and at work through the events of this pandemic. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, 
we praise you that you indeed are listening. You do bend down and hear the cries of your people. We praise you for our pastors, our musicians, and our technicians who enable this communal worship. We praise you that you are binding together our congregation, our state, and our country. Your kingdom is coming. Your will is being done. Yes, even through COVID-19. Yes, we can praise you even through our groaning. Amen. As we begin a new sermon series on the Ascension today, our scripture reading is from Hebrews 1, verses 1 through 14. You are invited to follow along in your Bibles at home. Hear the word of the Lord from Hebrews 1, 1 to 14. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact rep representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, today I have become your father? Or again, I will be his father and he will be my son. And again, when God brings his firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. In speaking of the angels, he says, he makes his angels spirits, and his spirits, his servants, flame of fire. But about the sun, he says, your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. A scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. He also says, In the beginning, Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will roll them up like a robe. Like a garment, they will be changed but you remain the same and your years will never end. To which of the angels did God ever say, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Ruth. Let's join our hearts in prayer. God, we thank you that you came to us, that you died and rose again. Father, even now we pray, help us to live in the reality of your resurrection. Help us to live in the reality of your victory. Help us to live in the reality of your rule over all things. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. When we recite uh, the Apostles' Creed together, we profess that Jesus ascended into heaven. And we also say that Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God the Father and that he will come to, live, to judge the living and the dead as well. 
When we say these things, what do we mean? What are we talking about? What truths are we professing? What does it mean that Jesus ascended to heaven and is sitting at the right hand of God the Father Almighty? Clearly, the authors of the Apostles' Creed thought that this thing that happened after the resurrection was really, really important. So I ask us today, what do we know about the ascension? Do we know anything about the ascension? It just so happens that there is a book of the Bible that deals a lot with issues related to the ascension and reign of Jesus Christ as king. And it's also a book of the Bible that you and I do not read from very often. You all might remember uh, from an article that I wrote this past summer uh, that I spent a week with some friends from seminary. And this picture is a a graduation picture uh, with the four of us who who went uh, away for a week and studied the book of Hebrews together. Because one of us, my friend Ben, uh, who is a professor at uh, uh, Trinity College, Uh, did his PhD dissertation on the book of Hebrews and he wanted to make his scholarly work on Hebrews accessible to the church. And so today I'd like to start a sermon series where we journey through the book of Hebrews together and we learn not only about our Savior who died and rose again, but that we learn about our Savior who ascended into heaven and who is ruling and who is reigning over us. Also, as we begin this series, I want to draw your attention to the bulletin cover that is on our website. And I know Steve is pulling this up on the screen right now for a few moments. This is a piece of artwork created by our own Katie Aubring that she made for this series. And there's an awesome write-up about this piece of art in our bulletins today about the symbolism of everything that you see here. And I invite you to check it out because what you're looking at right now is extremely complex and there's a lot going on. And the reason that this artwork is complex is because the book of Hebrews is very, very complex. Hebrews is as dense as the book of Romans, but it covers some very strange topics that the Apostle Paul does not address. Today, of course, we're looking at chapter 1 of Hebrews, which is really an introduction to the entire book. And of course, it needs to be noted today that the audience of the book of Hebrews are Hebrews. Jewish Christians, people who were once part of the Jewish faith and became part of the Christian church. And Jewish Christians, of course, when they come into the Christian church, they are bringing their own presuppositions and their own understandings about God. And the author of Hebrews was seeking to help them in their understanding as new Jewish Christians. And so in a brilliant way, the author of Hebrews begins by saying that God used to speak through prophets and through angels, but that now he speaks through his son. Jesus is the very speech of God, the radiance of God's glory. But really, the rest of chapter 1 and the focus of chapter 1 is about the reign and the throne of Jesus. And this letter of Hebrews and this whole sermon series is all about what flows out of the ascension of Jesus, out of the rule and reign of Jesus. Chapter 1 has all the markings of a coronation ceremony. And of course, we can't talk about coronation without speaking about Frozen. And now all of you are really, really listening. I will always associate coronation with the movie Frozen because when my daughter Madeline was turning five years old, she really, really wanted a Frozen dress for her birthday. And I learned that Elsa has two dresses that you could buy. One dress is her magical ice dress and the other was her coronation dress from her coronation ceremony. 
coronation day for Elsa was about becoming queen. A coronation is a ceremony where you are given the power to rule and to reign. And in Elsa's coronation, she was given the symbols of leadership. But of course, the coronation ceremony was not only for Elsa. It was also for the people of her kingdom. Before the coronation ceremony, Elsa is not queen. And after the coronation ceremony, she is queen. And once the coronation ceremony is complete, the people are to regard her and to respect her as queen. This is very, very similar to what the author of Hebrews is doing in chapter 1. The author of Hebrews is showing Jewish Christians the significance of Jesus as the Son of God. And he's basically having a coronation ceremony for Jesus right here in chapter 1 as a way of helping these Jewish Christians regard Jesus as their ruler. The main verse here, and the verse that is really the theme of the entire book of Hebrews, is Psalm 110, verse 3, where the Father says about the Son, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Now, I know that this sounds like a very confusing verse to us all. It's a very hard verse to understand, but this is a very, very important verse. So I'm going to pull it up on the screen for you once again. And I want you to know that this verse from Psalm 110, Jesus applies to himself several times in multiple passages. Paul quotes this verse from Psalm 110 in several passages. And even John uses this verse in the book of Revelation. Why is this strange verse from Psalm 110 so important? And another question that I think seems unrelated, but is actually a related question to this, is what is the deal with all of the angels? In the Bible, we hardly ever hear about angels, and this is perhaps the most extensive passage on on angels in all of Scripture. And so I'd like to take just a moment and, and take a break from this passage to speak about angels and why the author of Hebrews is bringing up angels. Because like most of you, most of what I learned about angels comes from this TV show. Touched by an angel. For those of you who are younger than me, there was a TV show in the 1990s called Touched by an Angel, which my parents would occasionally watch. And there were a couple of things that I learned about angels from Touched by an Angel. Number one, you know when an angel is speaking to you when there is a light that is illuminated around their head. And number two, angels can and should have Irish accents. But this show was really popular during the 90s for a while because angels are fascinating creatures. They're very mysterious and we love thinking about them during Christmas time. But for the author of Hebrews and for the Hebrews to whom these words are written, they saw angels as messengers of God. Angels were a very special way that God would reveal himself to his people. They were living embodiments of God to the people, a source of divine revelation, a source of divine message. Now, Why does the author of Hebrews speak so much about angels? I want to talk just for a second about signposts. I'm sure many of you have seen these around. Every now and then you find these signposts that point towards different locations that are all pointing in different directions. And these signposts are kind of fun to see because you can see where all kinds of different countries and locations are in comparison to each other. 
Each destination has a different location. And many times you walk away from these signs where they point at different locations and you say to yourself, huh, I thought that place was over there. I thought that place was over there. What the author of Hebrews is doing here, right in the first chapter, is he's taking all of these destinations, all of these Jewish destinations, these Jewish ideas, these realities that existed in the minds of Jewish people, they had a desire to be ki- for a king. They all knew about God's messengers, the angels. They all knew that God was supposed to be worshipped. They all had been hearing that Jesus was the son of God in some way. And they were now part of the Christian church and they were still taking their Jewish understandings with them. So what the author of Hebrews is doing in Hebrews 1 is he is taking all of these political realities and these human realities and these spiritual realities and these divine realities and he's pointing all of these Jewish realities to Jesus. And he's saying to these new Jewish Christians with all these Jewish ideas, he's saying to them, Jesus is all of these things that you are looking for. He's the best version of all of these things. Yes, we know that Jesus is God's revelation to us. He's God's word. Yes, we know that Jesus is our savior. Yes, we know that Jesus is our king. Yes, we know that Jesus is our God. But what the author of Hebrews is doing here is he's taking all of these amazing things and saying to us and reminding us and celebrating with us that we find all of these things in one person, Jesus Christ. The author of Hebrews is saying to these Jewish Christians, Jesus is a better messenger than even the angels. He's a better leader than all of the leaders of this world. He's a better king than all of the kings in history. He's a better priest, a better mediator than any other. He's the son of God and he is to be worshiped as God himself. The author of Hebrews is saying, Jesus is what you seek. No matter what it is that you're looking for, Jesus is what you seek. Jesus is a better, Jesus is better than any concept of any person or any angel or any ruler or any leader or any king or any prophet or any priest that we might have in our heads. Jesus is what they sought. And Jesus is what we seek. As human beings, we all long to worship something. We long to give something our adoration and our awe. As human beings, we want to be led and we want to be led well. We want a strong leader. As human beings created in the image of God, we want a connection to God. We want to feel close to the divine. As human beings who are broken, we want to feel forgiven and we want to feel accepted. As human beings who don't always know the truth, we want someone who speaks the truth. As human beings who don't always know how to bring justice, we want someone who will bring justice. And what the author of Hebrews is saying is that Jesus is all of these things. You will find all of these things in the person of Jesus. The application of Hebrews 1 is actually very, very simple. This passage calls us to worship Jesus and to find all that you're looking for in him. Don't worship angels. Don't worship the things of this world. Don't worship creatures. Don't worship the things you think are powerful. Worship the Son of God. 
This global pandemic has been very difficult. But I think one of the things that has, it has made us realize as human beings is that our leaders are not as strong as we think they were. That our medicine is not as powerful as we think it is. That our human ingenuity and technology and capability has its limit, limitations. And that our knowledge does not save us. This whole pandemic has made us realize as human beings, we are not as capable as we thought we were. Hebrews 1 meets us today in this pandemic and invites us. Put Jesus on the ultimate throne. Don't put science on that throne. Don't put world leaders on that throne. Don't put human capability and wisdom on that throne. Those are all important things, but they are not and cannot be our savior and they certainly are not our king. Hebrews asks us today, is Jesus our ruler? In Hebrews 1, the author is putting everything into into perspective. Jesus is to be worshipped because he is God. He is the leader that we're looking for. He's the king that we long to lead. He's the savior that we long to make us free. How often do we as human beings say things like, I wish God would just speak to me. Jesus is the speech of God. He's the ultimate messenger from God because he is God. He's the word made flesh. People of God, put your worship and your trust where it belongs, at the feet of Jesus. Whatever we think is better in this world, Whatever we may put on that throne that rules our lives, whatever leader we look to for leadership, whatever power of this world we look to for strength, whatever message we cling to for good news, Jesus is better, he is more, and he is worthy of our worship. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. God, we pray today that we would honor Jesus with our worship. That we would put him on the throne of our hearts. That we would regard him as king of our lives. And that he would rule our hearts and our lives in such a way that we would declare his rule and his reign by everything that we say and do. And God, today, as our leader and our king, we cry out to you. We call on you to deliver us. We call on you to heal us, to protect us, and to provide for us. We pray these things in the mighty name of our King Jesus. Amen. Well, now I invite you to go and sing the song Jesus Shall Reign and to use that lyric video. But before we do, I invite you to receive the parting blessing. And of course, as you receive this blessing, I invite you to remember that your brothers and sisters in Christ at Calvary Church are doing the same. People of God, receive this parting blessing. May God go before you to guide you. May God go above you to watch over you. May God go behind you to protect you. And may God go beside you to befriend you. Both now and forevermore. And everybody said, amen.